Welcome to the Manchester branch webinar um, on the date of our normal meeting. Uh, so, uh, just a few little administrative things. At, either at the bottom or top of your screen, if you move the mouse up or down, you will find a chat and a question and answers box. If you use the question and answers box for any questions to Chris when he starts talking, and the chat box, if you've got any questions of a more general nature to Chris, rather than just about the subjects. And also, if you've got any technical problems, we have Rohan in the background, who will help you to sort those out. Um, so, um, I, I, just to say a few words about Chris, um, which you may or may not know. Um, Chris is um, chairman of the Eastern Reg Region IWA and also chairman of the Peter Peterborough branch um, and a trustee. Um, he tells me he's done 3,000 locks in, on, on his boat um, since 2016. So, um, and I, I also discovered those are not all in the fens <laughs> and he has actually been up to Manchester. So uh, I think without any further ado, I'll hand over to Chris to, to talk to you. Right, good evening. Uh, I'll just put you on the, uh, show you some slides. Uh, right, where is the middle level, the Cambridgeshire Fens? Uh, well, it's in the east of England uh, on that waterways map. It's the area between the River Neen and the River Great Ouse. Uh, most of the navigations are man-made uh, because the area was drained in the 17th century uh, by uh, a Dutchman, Cornelius Vermuyden. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is the Bedford Level experiments of 1838 and 1870. From the secure perspective of the 21st century, we all know which camp we belong to, Zetatech or Globulist. No longer do heated arguments rage in the pub over whether the earth is flat, Zetatech, or round, Globulist. However, in the 19th century, this important concern was a hot subject for debate. Thanks to its straightness, the old Bedford River, which is marked with the uh, red arrow on the screen, became the proving ground for the counter arguments. In 1838, a Samuel Robotham endeavoured to prove the earth flat by making observations along the six mile straight from above Welney. Using a telescope, he observed barges six miles away, which is the middle uh, uh, of the illustrations. Uh, he argued that if the earth was round, as some scientists were starting to believe, the barges would only be visible be for three miles before they disappeared from, from sight, fell off the horizon due to the curvature of the earth. As he could still make out the barges six miles distant, ipso facto, there was no curve. This proof stood unchallenged until 1870, when Alfred Russell Wallace, inspired to renewed scientific scrutiny by uh, Darwin's work on evolution, conducted a further experiment on the old Bedford River. Three barges, each with a pole of identical length erected on them, were moored at two mile intervals. If the earth was flat, the tops of the three rods would line up when observed through a telescope. This is the lower of the illustrations. However, the second marker was a clear 32 inches above a line between the first and third markers, proving, quod erat demonstandum, the curvature of the earth. We now understand that Robotham's apparent ability to see further than the expected three miles was caused by the phenomenon of the refraction bending of light over water. Remarkably, the measurements obtained in the 19th century from these experiments to cal calculated the diameter of the earth at 7,920 miles. With 
with the benefit of modern scientific instrumentation, the diameter of the Earth at the equator is now known to be 7,926 miles. So uh, they, uh, they were fairly accurate about that. Remarkable. Uh, the next curiosity of the things uh, I was going to talk about is the hover train. Uh, in 1966, the introduction of two cross-channel hovercraft services raised public awareness of hovercraft. By 1968, car-carrying cross-channel craft led to hovering becoming all the rage. And in 1969, the government initiated experiments in an innovative tracked hovercraft. Uh, they built a one mile long experimental track again along the side of the Old Bedford River uh, between Sutton Gault and Erith. The intent was for a train hovering six inches above the track to run at speeds of up to 300 miles an hour and a golden era of super fast rail travel was envisaged with travel times between Glasgow and London dropping from six hours to two hours. In 1966, a British Pathé news film boasted, like to travel by train at 300 miles an hour? We may do so in a few years time. Forget about wheels, the hovercraft principle with a train supported by an air cushion and skimming over a magnetic field at near aircraft speed is a dream no longer. By February 1973, a speed of 104 miles an hour into a 20 mile an hour headwind was achieved, but the experiment was already running into trouble. Alternative maglev, magnetic levitation technology, was being developed and the Japanese were developing their own bullet train, which would eventually achieve speeds of 275 miles an hour in the 1990s. Advances were being made with the UK's other experiment in high speed trains, high speed rail travel, the ATP Advanced uh, Passenger Train, uh, APT. And the Minister for Aerospace and Shipping, a certain Michael Heseltine, pulled the plug on the tracked hovercraft. Little evidence remains today to testify to this bold technological attempt to lead the world. There are three concrete support pillars that still stand forlornly sticking out of the ground just north of Erith, which is the uh, which are the two two of the pictures at the bottom of the screen. While the engine RTV thirty one research test vehicle thirty one is preserved at Peterborough Rail World wildlife haven close to the banks of the River Neen and just yards away from the uh, railway line. That's a uh, picture at the top is of the uh, is the, of RTV 31. Uh, the comic history book 1066 and all that says of King John 1166 to 1216 that he began badly as a bad prince and finally demonstrated his utter incompetence by losing the crown and all his clothes in the wash. Of course this isn't an accurate historical account but it is generally agreed that John did lose the crown jewels to the waters somewhere round here. It's both interesting and potentially profitable to ponder where the treasure might have actually been lost. The earliest chronicler of the events shortly after Magna Carta was Roger of Wendover, uh, died 1236, a Benedictine monk at St Albans Abbey. He gives a graphic account of King John's journey from King's Lynn to Wisbeach suggesting that the king's belongings, including the crown jewels, were lost as he crossed one of the tidal estuaries which empties into the wash, being sucked in by quicksands and whirlpools. Roger was succeeded in 1236 as the Abbey of St Albans official recorder of events by Matthew Paris, who died in 1259, who wrote the Chronica Majora, a great record of English history of the period. 
Paris writes that King John attempted to force a passage over the water which is called the well stream and there suddenly and irrecoverably lost all his wagons, treasures, costly goods and regalia. A whirlpool in the middle of the water uh, absorbed all into its depth with men and horses so that hardly one escaped to announce the misfortune to the king. Another contemporary or similar timed report stated, then journeying towards the north in the river that they call well stream, by an unexpected accident, John lost all his wagons, cars and sumpter horses with the treasures, pressure ve precious vessels and all the other things which he loved so well, for the ground was opened up in the middle of the waves and bottomless whirlpools swallowed them up. The well stream was also known as the Wellney, Old Well and He or Old Croft River. Old Croft River. Where is or was the well stream? It's necessary to appreciate that the roots of the rivers Neen and Ouse were significantly different before everything changed, almost beyond recognition, uh, with Cornelius van Muyden's great drainage works in the 17th century. The Neen and Grey Ouse, long established rivers, rise within 15 miles of each other in Northamptonshire, but, but took very different routes to the sea. Prior to the 17th century, both rivers split into two arms and one arm from each of these rivers merged somewhere around Benwick before flowing out to sea in a great estuary half a mile wide uh, east of Wisbeach. In the 2nd century AD, the Roman polymath Ptolemy records this estuary as called Metaris. Typically, the well stream could be 50 to 100 foot wide as it wandered its way through Wellney, Upwell and Outwell, shifting its course over time. However, once Vermoyden's two great Bedford rivers cut through it, they removed both its waters and its significance. The Wisbeach Canal, which was authorised by an act of 1794 and closed in 1926, linked Outwell and Wisbeach and flowed along part of the route. The A1101, which runs from Bury St Edmunds through Littleport and Wisbeach to Long Sutton, and which is claimed to be the lowest road in Great Britain, or the lowest A road in Great Britain, rarely rising above sea level, follows much of the old course of the old river, including, sadly, the former route of the Wisbeach Canal. But the river still exists in Upwell and Outwell. This is the same well stream which King, Just King John lost his treasure crossing. Next time you cruise through Well Creek, through the pretty villages of Upwell and Outwell, when you've finished admiring the architecture reminiscent of Holland or the always beautiful array of spring flowers, cast your eyes downwards into the water. King John's fabled treasure might just be waiting nearby for you to find it. Uh, Mainist, Mainy Charterist Colony. Social discontent and change often follow after periods of major warfare. In the UK, the 1945 election of Clem Attlee's Labour government at the end of the Second World War is a prime example. Another great European struggle, the Napoleonic Wars, 1803 to 1815, led to a considerable period of turbulence in Britain. The economy had suffered from years of war. Thousands of ex-soldiers flooded the labour market, causing wages to fall below subsistence levels. Rioting became commonplace, including the comparatively infamous 1816 Littleport riots. The expanding industrial revolution and introduction of machinery threatened workers. The 1834 amendment to the poor laws broke up families by segregating workhouses. Against this troubled background, socialism flourished, demanding universal suffrage for men. Robert Owen painted a vision of a communitarian society promoting a utopian socialist economic vision of a new moral world and across the country chartist communities were set up. 
1838, a local farmer and Methodist minister, William Hodson, resolved to create a socialist col colony by building a small township on the west bank of the Old Bedford River on 200 acres of land at Maney Fen, now known as the Maney Fifties. The community started making its own bricks to build a church, house, workshops, a community building and school, a large pavilion and a windmill. They produced a newspaper, The Working Bee. Sadly, the dream didn't last. Disputes broke out within the community and in 1841, William Hodgson withdrew his financial support and within a couple of years, the colonists had all gone. People carried on living in the houses though, digging clay and making bricks, but occupation gradually dwindled. The 1851 census recorded 74 people living there, the 1881 census 27, and the last recorded record to be found is of a baptism in 1906. The abandoned brick pits flooded and were shown as swamps on the uh, 1980 Ordnance Survey map. Uh, still on Maney, uh, another interesting and little known fact about Maney is uh, that Charles I took a considerable interest in the first attempts to drain the fens which took place between 1630 and 1637 and proposed that a new national capital be built at Maney to be named after him Charlemont. This proposal was interrupted by the English Civil War 1642 to 1651 and after Charles was beheaded in January 1649 the proposal was abandoned. Great capital cities around the world, including Berlin, Rome, Moscow, London and Washington DC, if not initially built on poor ground, expanded into swamp and marsh ground, and Mexico City was built on the site of a lake. So perhaps the idea isn't quite as odd as it first appears. When I recently cruised up the Tem River Thames in my boat, past Charles Barry and August Pugin's Great Palace of Westminster, I tried to imagine Parliament alternatively located on the middle level on the banks of the old Bedford River. In view of the several, several centuries it was to eventually take to fully master fen drainage, perhaps it'd be better to try and paint a mental picture of the cradle of British democracy looking more like Venice. Um, in the 19th century, agricultural workers in remote Fenland villages had little or no means of travelling other than walking. In 1896, the vicar of Streatham resolved that if the people couldn't easily get to the church, he'd take the church to the people. He acquired three horse-drawn wagons and sent them out into the Archdeaconry of Huntington as travelling churches. This experiment was largely successful, except in the fens, where often the roads and droves were impassable, impassable in summer due to deep ruts and in winter because of mud. Although travelling churches provided a solution for much of Huntingdonshire, it was clear that something else was necessary to take religion into the less accessible parts of the fens. In 1896, a floating church was commissioned to serve the Fenland parish of Home. At the time, Home had 42 houses spread over a distance between two and four miles from parish church, but they were all within one mile of the river and 26 of them were practically bankside. Built at Stanground outside Peterborough, the floating church was launched in April 1897. She was dedicated to St Withburger, daughter of Anna, King of the Angles, and likely sister to both St Ethelreda uh, of Ely and St Wendreda of March. Unable to ring spells, 
bells <laughs> from a conventional spire because it wouldn't have fitted under the bridges. The floating church, or ark as it came to be known, flew two flags, those of St Andrew and St George, to announce that services were about to start. Between its launch, at launch and October 1904, a choir was formed, needlework and Bible classes held, and 74 baptisms are recorded as having taken place on board. In 1905, the barge was sold to the parish of Mainly to serve Welsh's Dan, Pearls Bridge, and the former colony, uh, colony at Mainly, all isolated communities next to the old Bedford River. However, the houses at the colony were abandoned within a year and the congregation shrank to an unsustainable level. In the 1907, the barge was abandoned near Ramsey St Mary before being sold off to a group of young men who renamed it Saints Rest, converted it into a houseboat and moored it near Orton Staunch on the uh, River Neen. During severe flooding, probably in August 1912, she finally sank. So closing a strange little chapter of Fenland history. Dorothy L. Sayers, one of the queens of English detective fiction, grew up first in the Fenland parish of Bluntisham and later in Christchurch, uh, also in the middle level, where her father was rector. The family seat of her aristocratic fictional detective, Lord Peter Winsey, was Denver. Now, Denver Sluice is the uh, great, uh, great barrier between the uh, tidal river grey twos and the non-tidal river ooze and central to the draining of the fens. It's right at the heart of the fens. Uh, Whimsy, uh, Lord Peter Whimsey helped defend his brother, the 16th Duke of Denver, when he became the chief murder suspect in Sayers' novel Cloud of Witnesses, in which he was tried by his peers before the full House of Lords. Her choice of the name Denver for the fictional dukedom reveals her Fenland roots. Her 1834 mystery, the award-winning The Nine Tailors, is set in the fictional Fenland village of Fenland St Paul. The end of the book includes a vivid description of a massive flood and it is hard to avoid the conclusion that Sayers herself must have witnessed similar flooding when growing up in the fens. It's a real risk. The, uh, the, the banks come down and the area gets inundated by the sea and it, it's a huge event. When, well, fortunately it doesn't happen anymore, but it was a huge event. It's rumoured that several characters in the book share names with graves in Blunting, Bluntisham churchyard. But unfortunately, because of the uh, travel restrictions, I wasn't able to uh, go and... Uh, check how true that uh, true that rumour was. Winter skating on a frozen river or field is a unique experience. The crisp sound underfoot, a sharp wind in your face, cold extremities gradually warming from the glow of exercise and a sensation akin to flying as the countryside passes by effortlessly. I would compare the difference between the sensation of unrestricted open air skating and the confines of an artificial rink to the difference between swimming over a coral reef on the Indian Ocean or taking a dip in a coronated 25 metre pool. Skating using animal bones tied to the bottom of boots had been employed by Fenland hunters and trappers for centuries. Visiting Dutch drainage engineers in the 17th century brought iron shafts with them, which enabled far greater speed and distances to be achieved. On the frozen meres and rivers of the Fens, skating became enormously popular in the cold winter at the end of the 19th century, evocatively described by Dickens and now considered a mini ice age, uh, when there were the great ice fairs on the River Thames in London. Thousands of people would attend speed skating matches and characters with names like William Turkey Smart, 
his brother Fish Smart, James Gutterperch C and Charger Leg and Swearing Jack Cooper attracted significant fame and fortune. Several Fenland villages claim to be the home to Bandy, which developed into the modern game of ice hockey. In 1870, a race was staged between a train travelling the four miles from Little Port to Ely and a skater on the frozen new course of the Great Ooze, which ran parallel. It is said that the hot coals were thrown from the train onto the ice in an attempt to sabotage the skater, but never, nevertheless, the skater finished the winner by half a minute. Now, I know this piece of water quite well, uh, and although the railway's close to the, uh, to the, to the uh, river, uh, to actually throw hot coals that distance would be quite a remarkable achievement. Old wrought iron skates are quite a common sight in antique shops. They reveal an interesting sociological perspective. Workers in the 19th century laboured six days a week with no time for sport or recreation and on the seventh day, Sunday, sport was expressly forbidden. However, when the factories and mills froze up, unexpected and unpaid, leisure time was created and skating became possible using skates strapped onto work, sturdy working boots. In the last 20 years, there have been few opportunity, opportunities for fen, fen skating due to warmer winters and fewer freeze-ups. Philippa Pierce's classical children's story, Tom's Midnight Garden, describes a fictional skating trip in Edwardian times along the frozen rivers Cam and Grey Twos from what can be identified as Great Shelford, a suburb of Cambridge, to Ely. The dis this description more powerfully evokes the special experience of fence skating than anything else I have ever read. The Wisbeach Canal. In the, uh, in the late 18th century, Wisbeach, fearing its prosperity was being threatened by the growth of King's Lynn, resolved to strengthen its trade links by the construction of a canal between the River Neen and the Well Creek in Outwell. Opened in 1796, the canal largely followed the line of the old well stream, an important river from the pre-Vermoyden era. It was a level canal with the only locks being at either end. I think it would be unfair to describe it as a contour canal because there are very few contours around here. Uh, it was fed from the Neen, from the River Neen, by opening the gates and allowing water in at high tide or spring tides, high tide on specific spring tides. These tides inevitably carried and deposited silt. For its entire short life, the canal suffered from silting up and water shortages because it could only be filled fortnightly. In fact, I think the uh, left-hand picture uh, demonstra illustrates that uh, very well. Uh, although primarily carrying freight, a passenger service ran for a few years, wide browse packing, which charged two pence from Outwell to Wisbeach. The passenger service ceased with the opening of the Wisbeach and Upwell steam tramway in 1883. The tramway closed to passengers in 1927 and to, fr but, and to freight in 1966, but lives on in the writings of the Reverend Audrey. In 1926, a warrant of abandonment was issued on the canal and it closed. During the 1960s, it was filled in. It joined the River Neen in Whits Beach, just above the Freedom Bridge. Although its route through Whits Beach has largely disappeared under roads, much of the route east of Whits Beach could be followed and even the remains of the lock at Outwell found. Uh, there are great patches of vacant land between the road and people's front gardens where the 
canal used to uh, run but I've never found any appetite for uh, for restoring this canal because it would be actually be one of the well certainly compared to some of the great canal restorations that happened in the Pennines uh, it would be one of the simpler canal restorations but I think the problem always remains of an inadequacy of, uh, of a water supply. Uh, and I've already referred to it, the Wisbeach and Upwell Tramway deserves its own little section. Uh, it played a surprisingly important part in the changing history of 19th and 20th century transport. The tramway was built in 1883-4 to complete with the Wisbeach Canal. The authorities, the uh, authorization sorry to construct it was contained in the 1881 Great Eastern Railway Act. To save costs it was constructed under the Tramway Act of 1870. The uh, track was laid to the standard railway specification rather than the alternative tramway spec. It served Wisbeach, Outwell and Upwell for the most part running next to Well Creek and the Wisbeach Canal. The line was popular from the outset, with 3,000 passengers a week using it in 1884. This success led to the passing of the 1896 Light Railways Act, which resulted in the uh, construction of many more localised light railways around the country. The initial speed limit of 8 miles an hour was raised to 12 miles an hour in 1904. The Wisbeach Canal was already struggling when the tramway opened and it gradually lost more and more trade to the tramway, eventually closing in 1922. However, by then the tramway itself was facing increasing competition from road transport, specifically buses, and the passenger service finished in 1927. The tramway coaches transferred to other light railways, with one coach appearing in the classic 1953 Ealing film, The Titfield Thunderbolt. Freight traffic continued on the tramway, its original steam engines were replaced by diesel, and in 1952 it achieved the dubious distinction of being the first line in Britain to be entirely powered by diesel locomotives. Sadly, in 1966, the line fell victim inevitably to the Beeching Act, finally closing on the 23rd of May 1966. The Reverend Audrey, who, uh, who was a minister in this region, was a great fan of the railway, and in his book Toby the Tram Engine, Toby and his uh, coach Henrietta are based on stock used on the line. Uh, well, that is generally a sampler of bits of uh, Fenland history. Nothing there was meant to be comprehensive, but to uh, encourage you to come and visit us and to, uh, to uh, perhaps look things up yourself. I'll uh, explain that uh, prior to the 2018 Festival of Water, which was held in St Neots on the River Grey Twos in my region, uh, I wrote some cruising guides to help people come down the Nine, the Nien or Nen, across the middle level and the Grey Twos to get to St Neots. Uh, because the Imrays, uh, who published the local cruising guides, Nicholson's and Pearson's don't cover this area, but Imray's guide had been written by, well, had been written by a historian that really didn't know very much about boating. Uh, and even his history was, I didn't think, terribly interesting or relevant. So anyway, I wrote these guides uh, and Imray's <laughs> saw them and they're only short things that are still online on the uh, IWA website uh, and said to me well yeah that's really nice Chris would you uh, like to write, write some guides for us so uh, at the moment I'm just working it's uh, it's being uh, laid out and proofread and uh, the guide to the Fenland waterways which contains will contain this and much more interesting information uh, and other than that I will uh, commend to you our beautiful fast well our beautiful clear flowing rivers which uh, 
come as something i mean i enjoy the canals and spend a lot of my uh, a lot of the summer on the canal networks but i would commend to you the uh, the, the rivers uh neen and gray twos thank you back to you phil if you unmute yourself well we're all muted and nobody's heard me I'll try again. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Can everybody hear me now? Um, the I have one question for you. Uh, I have some thanks coming from Carolyn Schaefer. How fast did the RTV one get on its trials? Do you know? oh, oh yes, I've got that figure. It's a hundred and seven miles an hour, I think into uh, 104 miles an hour and that was within a 20 mile into a 20 mile headwind which the uh, author of the definitive book on it proudly suggests <laughs> so not quite the 300 but not doing too badly <laughs> yeah but it, it, it did take the bullet train a long time to get up to its 275 miles an hour <laughs> Uh, that's another question I could, could ask you, which is, uh, it's actually from my own experience, just in the upper part of the, the river, Nen, or Neen, uh, I was pronouncing it Neen when I was on the boat, and I was corrected by locals to call it the Nen, which is correct. Halfway down, the river flows through uh, a lovely old bridge at Heim Ferris. And the argument is that above Heim Ferris, it is the Nen, which is also the territory of Northampton branch, and below Heim Ferris is the River Nen. But I believe it's the Nen. The locals all call it the Nen. But when at Christmas I was asked to give the uh, after dinner speech to the Northampton branch, I actually found it quite useful because every time I said Nen, the whole of the meeting, who by then had a couple of glasses of wine or whatever, chorused, I'd say Neen, they'd chorus Nen, so it was quite a good uh, crowd stirrer. I think we have, we do have one question. Um, this comes from Alan Mould. I do not have a boat, but hire regularly. Are there hire bases around the area that allow you to explore the area? Yeah, absolutely. There are several, but in the heart of the middle level is a Fox narrow boat. So I'd thoroughly, well, actually my boat is a former Fox narrow boat and perhaps I'm biased, they're friends of mine, but they're, uh, that's, that's one place you can go. Uh, and there's also a hire company immediately on the, uh, on the river grade twos where you can hire both narrow boats, but, and also uh, fiberglass cruisers. Thank it's, you, funny, it's funny, actually, I said to my, I said to my children, uh, they reached a point at which, you know, they were growing up and I said, I think we're probably going to have our last family holiday. This is before I had a narrow boat of my own. Uh, I, I said, would you like to go on one last holiday together on a narrow boat? Because I'd figured that, uh, you know, the, the children were teenagers and if they wanted to go off on their own they could only walk one day down way down or one of two ways down the towpath and would find us again uh, and they said yeah we'd love to uh, lo love to go on a marabout holiday dad and i said well would you uh yeah shall we go shall we go locally in the fens and they said no we want hills so uh, we came up to the uh, we, we came up to the St Gofflin canal and uh, and uh, had a very nice uh, high boat holiday up there but the uh, but it's very flat down here so the kids quite enjoyed the change 
Okay, we've got a couple more questions, and just to reiterate what Roman Rowan has just sent out as a message, and I should have said at the beginning, if you wave your mouse usually to the bottom of the screen or the top of the screen, you should find a set of buttons appear, one of which is Q&A, so if you want to ask questions, please do so. Um, uh, these are just comments really, one saying thanks, the other one saying thank you, an interesting section of curiosities, I look forward to cruising the fens again. Uh, so, uh, no new questions that I can see. So, I, I think it's probably time to draw this to a close. So, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we can't give you a round of applause because uh, there's not be nobody else has speakers. Well, it's it's been a pleasure, and I hope I uh, I hope I see a few few of you cruising the cruising the fence sometime. Stop and say hello to me. My boat's called Lily May. I'm quite well known down here. And I've just got a few more things to say, um, just to Manchester branch members. Um, the, as far as we know so far, difficult to predict in the future, but we're still planning to hold our um, Rowan, Nick Grundy has it. I shall continue for a moment. Nick Grundy may have a question to ask. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, we still plan to hold our AGM and trip, um, boat trip, together with quiz and buffet on September 7th, which is a week earlier than our normal AGM day in the month. Um, and assuming that the virus allows us to do that, that, that you'll be hearing from us about that sometime in August. Um, there's also some talk, other talks going on, um, which are, if, tomorrow night is one of them, in fact, from the IDO, IWA, um, basically on waterways generally. Um, so the next one is tomorrow. There is an interesting one for Manchester branch on, 20, on the 28th, um, where Maria is giving a talk on the changing face of the Ashton Canal. So uh, I hope everyone will tune into that, that's at 7.30 on the 28th of April. Okay, um, we're still, I, I can't say a great deal more about our further programme, it's a bit difficult to actually make any decisions on that at the moment, so I, I should be doing my best to get things together on that. So thank you very much everybody, I think um, this, we should draw this webinar to a conclusion. <laughs>